It's been one of those days that drives me to my knees when there were more questions than answers and all of the things I can't figure out have left me with more tears than laughter. the 
north, the south, the east, the west, all nations shall gather in. God will train his bloodstained rugged cross for royal
like your choir like a babe when it cries for its mother like a child I was helpless alone then I met the master Statistics at a home without a dad, we find out that when there is not a father in the home, that that home is four times greater to live in poverty. That it's more likely that the children will have behavioral problems. It has two times greater risk of infant mortality when there's not a father in the home. And it's more likely that the children, more of the children in fatherless homes end up going to prison. Without a father in the home, it is more likely that the children will commit crimes. It is seven times, this one blew me away, seven times more likely with no father in the home that the teenager, one of the teenagers in the home will end up pregnant as a teenager seven times now I know this doesn't always uh, these statistics don't always fall true in every home but we have uh, almost 20 million children in our in our country who have no father at home and will not have a father or stepfather the whole time that they're growing up 
more likely to face abuse and neglect, more likely to be involved in drug abuse or alcohol, and twice as likely to drop out of school before they graduate. But with a father in the home, having a father at home, they tell us that the infant mortality rate drops. That with a father at home, there's even less likely chance that the baby would be born with a low birth rate. It doesn't have as many emotional and behavioral problems. There's not as much neglect and abuse when there is a father in the home. Less abuse for school, uh, less chance of school, bad school performance, less teen pregnancy, less incarceration, less alcohol, less substance abuse, and less suicide when there is a father in the home. These are not my statistics. These are taken by the Census Bureau. This is not a Christian group. This is just the facts. This is just what our government tells us when it comes to having a dad at home. And in having a father at home, having a dad at home, it helps the moms. This is what it tells us it does for uh, the mom. There's more likely to have more, it's more likely that they have more parental care and less worry about having to rely on others for the child to have care. It's more likely that they have healthier births when there's a mom and dad at home. It helps the mother to have a dad involved in the birthing situation. There is lower risk of postpartum stress. There's lower risk of postpartum depression. It lowers the parenting stress to have a helper. And there's more time for leisures when mom have a dad at home and a father, stepfather, that's involved. And moms are, are their, their marital satisfaction is higher when they have a father or a stepfather that is helping them. Now our society, and this started in the 60s with the feminist movement, our society has changed its view and its ideas of fathers. When I was growing up, we watched television shows like... Uh, Father's, father Knows Best, and Leave It to Beaver, and <laughs> Andy Griffith. And you had men like Ben Cartwright as fathers on television. And these men were they're seen, uh, not as perfect, but they were seen as strong role models in our society. Now, starting in the 90s especially, now dads at home, they, they seem to be some doofus that can't get out of his own way. Some binge drinking, alcoholic, skirt chasing pervert that by the end of some sitcom episode is going to have to have his wife come and rescue him or the teenagers come in and help daddy out of a problem. Isn't that what you see? And it, it was bad enough that they did that on the regular sitcoms, but what they did is they did it on the cartoon sitcoms. So children watching television or using the remote may run across a cartoon and think, well, this would be fun to watch. This would be, this is a cartoon. This is like the other cartoons that I watch. And instead, they're watching South Park or something filthy. Or The Simpsons. Or they're watching something that uh, puts the dad down and makes dad look like he doesn't know what he's doing. And it takes, a, it takes somebody else to help dad kind of figure out what he needs to do. And I didn't grow up with a daddy like that. You didn't grow up with a daddy like that. Charles Fisher was not a dad like that. And T. Gross was not a daddy like that. My dad was a man's man. My dad had masculinity. My Teague had masculinity. And there's no such thing as toxic masculinity. Now that they're trying to take it out of our society, it has produced the wrong things when it comes to manhood. They're looking at manhood the wrong way. As if there's something wrong with being male. Or if there's something wrong with being a man. Paul said this about manhood. See, when I was a child... I thought as a child, but when I became a man, I put away childish things. I put aside the childishness. So when I began to understand as an adult, I put away the way I thought as a child and I began to think like a man and I began to be a man's man and I began to do manly things. According to the Bible, Genesis chapter three, the Bible says that the man shall work by the sweat of his face. And that's what we're to do, men. In what we're taught in society, we're to work for leisure. No, that is not what you're to do. 
You are to work to bring food home for your family. That's what men are to do. We are to work to bring food home for our family. For Adam, it was a different way than it was for us. But whatever job you have, that's your responsibility to make sure that you bring something home for, for your family to have to eat. And then when you get home, it's not that you kick back in a recliner for hours and ignore the family. Instead, when you get home, you work on your marriage. You work on your family. You spend time with those that are around you. It doesn't mean you don't have leisure. It does not mean you get to go do the things that you like to do. It means that you do the work first. And with the hours you have left, then you do your leisure. You put in time with your wife and you put in time with your children and you put in time with your family. I'm not, I'm not going to bash you all over the head all day. I'm just saying that's what we're made to do. And I want to say if you're over the age of 30 and still living home with mom and dad playing video games, you've not grown up. You're still a child. A child plays games. A man doesn't play games. I'm not talking about sports. I'm talking about Video games. Put it down, man. Good night. How, in the, how old are you going to have to be to put down games? Be a man. Put away those childish things. And then they say, let them play sports. Sports builds character. I will say that sports does build character. If they're around the right characters, sports will build character. But I want to tell you, if sports really did build character, the people in the NBA and the NFL wouldn't be caught abusing their wives in DUIs, acting like a bunch of, <laughs> acting like a bunch of, uh, well, I can't think of a good word to say there. It was going to be a Christian word. Some of y'all think <laughs> thugs acting like a bunch of thugs in their life, spoiled bunch of children, bunch of brats. Be a man. There's nothing wrong with being a man. Sports does teach character, but you have to be around some characters to learn that. Now, the Bible teaches us, and Jesus says in Matthew chapter 15, he says, he says these things to those that are questioning him. For God commanded, saying, Honor your father, thy father and mother, and he that, and he that curseth father or mother, let him die the death. But ye say, whosoever shall say unto his father or mother, it is a gift. And by, by whatsoever thou mightest be, be prophet of me. And he said, and, honor, and not honor not his father or mother, he shall be free. Thus ye have made the commandment of God of none effect by your traditions. You know that verse 4 is talking about one of the ten commandments. God put together the first home in the garden. And the first home consisted of one wife, one husband, and that was God's intent for man's satisfaction and joy when it comes to the home. Anything else is a perversion of the home. The first group that took in uh, other wives, Lamech and his family, those were the ones that had brought into the world the Nephilim, and they had destroyed what the home was supposed to be. And many got it wrong after that. And those that are, that are changing the standard of the home, God had one standard, one man, one woman, for life. Now, I know it doesn't always work out, and God knows it doesn't always work out. He did write the laws of divorcement. But let me tell you why God gave us a family. Men, husbands, fathers, this is what the family is for. Number one, it's for learning. The Ten Commandments were not given to the church. The Ten Commandments were not necessarily given to the nation of Israel. The Ten Commandments God gave to the home. To be taught in the home. To be rehearsed in the home. The first five talk about our relationship to God. The second five talk about our relationship to man. It begins with thou shalt not worship any other God. And it starts in the other section with thou shalt not commit murder. There's a relationship to God our children ought to have. And there's a relationship to men our children ought to have. So God gave us the home for learning. Number two, God gave us the home for living. To teach us how to live. That the home would be our portion of the Garden of Eden on this earth. The man goes out and works by the sweat of his face. 
But when he comes home, hopefully there's a beautiful wife there to greet him when he gets home. Lovely children for him to greet when he gets home. That was to be his Garden of Eden. That was not to be the place where he was tortured or deprived. That's the place where he gets his fulfillment. That's the place where she gets her fulfillment. That's the place where the children get, get their fulfillment. That home was to be for living. What we think many times is I got to go out and do this to live. And I got to go out and do this to live. No, God wanted you to do your living at home. We got all kinds of rooms that we title them by what's in there. We have a bed and a room. We call it a what? Bedroom. If you've got a room somewhere in your house, it may not be necessarily that that's what that room was designed for. But if there's a computer in it, what do you call that room? That's the computer room. Or the office. We have one room that everybody kind of hangs out in. What do we call that? The living room. God gave us the home to teach us living. How to live in this world. And then God gives us a home for lasting. To teach our children. When we teach them the, the Ten Commandments. This is a commandment with promise. If you honor your father and mother. It rewards you with what? A long life. Long days. It could be a long life if you're respectful and honor your father and your mother. And it teaches us as human beings together. We are so much better together. When there's two together, they can be warmed in a bed. When there's two together, they can fight for one another. When there's two together, the Bible teaches us it's better for someone to have somebody. And when you have somebody, the stress is lower. The stress lowers your heart problems. The stress lowers your anxiety problems. The stress, when it's lower, it, it lowers that emotional problem so that your life may be, may be a long life on this earth by and, and through the means of the home. So if I'm going to be a dad that's honorable... How can I be honorable to my children? Now it is true that children should honor their father and mother because it's a commandment. You do it because God commanded you to do it. Whether your parents are honorable or not. Whether you have respect for them or not. You do it because God told you to. And if you do that, God will give you long life on this earth. But let me say to the fathers today, this is how you can be honorable. This is how you can become honorable. This is how your children can see honor in you. Number one, realize and know that, that you're not perfect and they're not perfect. <laughs> they're not perfect. And you can say amen right there. But you know you're not perfect. So it takes both imperfect creatures... Who do things wrong sometimes to live and exist together and, and to form a relationship where you are honorable and they are honoring you. And one of the honoring things is let them see that you're not perfect. When you mess up, apologize. Tell them you messed up. Tell them you made a mistake. Well, let's go through this list right here. How I can become. Number one, love them. Love your children. Hugs can go a long way when it comes to your children. It teaches children, hugs teach children the right physical contact they should have with another being. Hugs should be given often and many times. When you come in their presence and when you leave their presence, you ought to give them hugs. You ought to love on them and care about them. Let me just show you what you should teach your kids from zero to six. From zero to six, you should be teaching them to respect their mother. From zero to six, you should demand that that child respect their mother. And then you should teach mom and, uh, for them to be obedient to, God, to mom and dad because mom and dad are called to be obedient to God. This is what I told my girls. If I correct you, if I do what I do for you, I'm doing it because I have to be obedient to God. I'm held accountable to God by the way that I raise you. So what I'm doing, I'm not doing because it's fun. I, and discipline is never fun for a parent. We don't enjoy. Well, sometimes we don't. En sometimes we do enjoy. <laughs> They've been mean enough. You want to get even a little bit. But it's not a joy to do that. But I have to do it because God has told me to train you up. God has told me to correct you. Let them be, teach them to be respectable, uh, respectable to their mother or your, their, your spouse. And then make sure that you let them know mom and dad have to be obedient to God. Honor your mate 
in their presence. Don't ever make fun of your spouse around your kids. Don't make them a joke. Don't laugh at them. Unless something funny happens, you can laugh. But don't laugh at them and make fun of them or ride them. Always help your child to remember their special days. Always. Zero to six. Not many five-year-olds going to come in and say, Dad, today's mom's birthday. No. You help them remember that it's mom's birthday. And whether it's a handwritten card or whether it's a Mother's Day card or Father's Day card, you help that young person respect and honor their mom and dad by giving them something on their birthday and those special days. And Christmas, let them know we need to get mom something. It could be any little trinket, any little thing, any little ornament mom would be happy with. But let that child have something for mom on birthday and mom on Mother's Day and dad on Father's Day and special events and special days. From 7 to 12, you can teach them. Once they learn those things from 7 to 12, explain to them how to honor their parent. How to honor their mother and father. How do I do this? I clean in my room. By making my bed. By mowing the yard without being told to do it. By taking out the trash without being told to do it. This is how I honor them. You do that by positive reinforcement. If they do pick something up, if they do pick up a toy, if, you, if they do clean their room, when you come home, just brag on say, boy, your room looks so good. Ought to look like that all the time. I'm so proud of you. You did a wonderful job cleaning that room. And if they never clean their room, then you've got to correct them. You've got to discipline them. That's the next thing. Deal swiftly with disrespect and sass. One day I was standing on the stairs of our split-level home. Some of y'all grew up in split-level homes. There was a set of stairs that went down in the living room and then a set of stairs that went down in the basement. And I was standing there on the steps of my home, all my arrogance and pride, and I was probably 12. And I sassed my mom. She was, she was in the kitchen fixing my meal, fixing a meal for the family. And I sassed my mom. And when I did, I knew she couldn't get to me, so I turned to run up toward the bedroom. And when I did, my dad's belt buckle was right there. I didn't just have to hear it. I could see his hand reach for that belt buckle. The belt come off, I don't remember touching a stair. I went upstairs with him, and he reminded me, that's my girlfriend. That's my wife. You don't ever talk to her that way. From 7 to 12, you deal swiftly with disrespect and sass. Avoid put-downs of your spouse. Don't ever do that around your kids. From 13 up, 13 up, you realize that 13 in the Bible is the number of rebellion? It's the first year that they're a teenager. Oh, we've been through the teenage years. From 13 to 20, if you subtract 20 from 13, what do you get? Seven years of tribulation. That's exactly what it is. When they get to be 20 and they have to go out and earn a living or work a job and they have to get their own paycheck and they have to pay their own bills, some lights start going off and they start realizing, maybe I don't know everything. Maybe I, I don't have the world by the tail. Maybe I'm going to have to work to make something of myself. From 13 up, this is what you should teach them. Encourage them to continue in that honoring that they have been taught. Even though they may know that you're wrong, Teach them to honor you. This is what I used to tell my girl. You can disagree with me, but you cannot shout at me. You can, when I get through or I punish you or whatever, you can sit down and say, now, Dad, listen. Respectfully, you can say, this is why I, I want you to understand. I didn't mean to do it that way or I didn't say that. And that's not what I meant when I said that. You can always disagree, but you have to do it respectfully. Encourage them to continue in that respect and that honor. As a parent, you always admit your own mistakes. If you were wrong, if you didn't understand the situation, or you heard something wrong, be willing to say, I'm sorry. I thought you meant something else, or I thought you were saying something else, or I thought you were doing something else. Remind them that one day they will want their children to be honorable. Mom and dad had the, what they called the official curse. And it went on something like this. I am praying that one day God will give you a child just like you. 
That's the official curse. And I can testify for me and my brothers, it is true, it is true, it is true. You're going to get one just like you. So remind them, if you disobey me, remember, God remembers that. If you want your children to honor you. Now, if you teach them these things, you are loving them. By teaching them what the word of God says and what honor and respect is, you are loving them. But make sure that at home, they're not getting the love that they need at school, necessarily. They're not getting the love that they need around their friends. They're not going to get it from television. They're not going to get it from any other person in the world. When they come home, that needs to be a place of love. No matter what they've done, no matter what they've been involved in, there's an unconditional love that they can receive at home. Number two, lift them up. Encourage them. Many times as parents, we're always looking for the time to catch them. The only time we mention something to them is when they've done something negative. I knew you did that. I knew you were the one that did that. But when they do something positive, many times we don't say a word to them. If your children came to church with you this morning without pitching a fit, you ought to go home and say, thank you for coming to church with me, kids. Thanks for coming and not pitching a fit and acting like you're miserable and acting like you don't want to go to church. If your children do something at home positive, if they mow the yard, if they clean, if they take out the garbage without being told, if they pick up their shoes, if they're respectful, say thank you so much for being respectful. That encouragement, that positive reinforcement can go a long way. It's a whole lot easier to do that than the negative reinforcement But we have to do both. If it's just negative, negative, negative all the time, then that child sees God as negative, negative, negative. Never pleased. Because what they see in you, they see it in God. He's the heavenly father. You're the earthly father. If we're to honor our earthly father, then I must be honoring to my heavenly father. A lot of times as Christians, we think the boundaries of God's word have been written so we can't have fun. That is not the truth. God has written those boundaries so that if I stay inside those boundaries, I'm free. I live in the liberty of Christ. Those boundaries are there to keep me from going into dangerous areas, areas that would hurt me. And eventually, if I keep playing around with the wrong things, he'll say to me, that's it. Come on to the house. If you're not going to listen, come to the house. But you need to set those limits for your children. If you're going to be honorable, this is why. Then they know wherever I am, whatever I'm doing, if God, if my dad has set me in this classroom, then my dad knows this is safe in here. If, God, if my dad has allowed me to play this sport, my dad knows that it's safe for me to be in this sport. If I'm here and, and my dad has set me here and told me to obey and do what they're doing, then my dad takes care of me. My dad loves me. My dad cares about me. My dad knows it. It's okay for me to be here. Can I say that about my heavenly father? If I'm here this morning, if he's allowed me to come, if he's given me a will in his life to accomplish, and I'm inside that will, wherever I am, whatever I'm doing, I know my heavenly father sees what I'm doing and he will keep me safe. Hallelujah. When you set those limits, it's a boundary of safety for those kids. And it it causes you to be honorable because they realize My dad's never going to stop taking care of me. Now this goes in their adulthood, not with just playing and boundaries with playing, but they'll want to come talk to you when they buy a house. Dad, what do you think about this? They'll want to talk to you when when it comes to getting a lawyer or having to deal with cars or whatever. Why? Because they know dad's got my best intention in mind. Next, lead them. Love them, lift them. Limit them and then lead them. Train up a child in the way they should go. And this is the word that is used there in the Hebrew. It is a word meant for training, meaning you do that in front of them to show them how to do it. Many of you men were in the military. You had a drill sergeant. And when it came time for the morning run, did the drill sergeant say, Hey, fellas, get your clothes on. I want you to run five miles. I'll see you when you get back. No. What did he do? He ran right alongside of you, encouraging you and kicking you along the way, showing you how to do it. That that drill sergeant was there to train you because the minute you're going to be left, you're going to be gone to be a soldier. And when you're gone, that drill sergeant knows that his, his training is going to save your life. Parents, let 
me tell you something. The way you train your, chi- your kids is you say, follow me. Let me show you how to do this. Because one day you're going to be out in the war on your own. One day you're going to be in the battle on your own. And I've got to show you some things now that will help you and keep you safe when you're battling on your own. You ought to teach them to come to church. You ought to teach them to serve the Lord. You ought to teach them to obey the Bible. You ought to teach them to love God with all their heart. You ought to teach them to serve God. You ought to teach them that nothing comes between them and their relationship with God. Somebody say amen. Amen. Lead them like a drill sergeant trains those soldiers. Because their life does depend on it. It's not just their life. It's your grandkids' lives. If your kids are not taught to serve the Lord, they may grow up not serving the Lord, and then your grandkids may not even know the Lord. We've seen it happen in generation after generation after generation. One generation gets saved, gets out of the world. The next generation, the Bible says, with Cain, in the process of time, they begin to think it's not important. They begin to think what was preached was not important. They begin to think the Word is not important. In the process of time, Cain thought, there's got to be a better way. I don't need... Go beg Abel for sheep and bullocks. There's got to be a better way. So in the process of time, Cain said, I'm going to do it a little different. I'm going to do it my way. I'm going to do it a different way. And there's a generation that comes along that thinks, ah, oh, mom and dad didn't know what they were talking about. Mom and dad didn't know what they meant when they were talking about serving the Lord. So I believe I'll just stay out of church. I believe I'll just stop serving the Lord. And a baby comes and that baby's not brought to Sunday school. And a baby's brought up in, in the world. And the baby's never influenced by the church. And they never they never are around the things of the church and that baby grows up and they become a teenager and then that teenager doesn't know anything about God but from what they see from their grandparents and the next generation doesn't know God at all. Lead them. So I don't know, preacher, I, I just got saved. I don't know how to lead them. You're doing the right thing by being here today. This is where we learn how to lead. This is how I learned how to lead. Come to Sunday school. Come to Sunday morning. Come to Sunday night. Come to Wednesday night. Along the way, God's going to run across what you need to help lead your family and show you how to be the father, the husband, the wife, the mother, uh, the adult that you need to be. God will reveal himself. Lead them. He is your heavenly father. He will lead you. This is what the Bible says about him, the Holy Spirit. He will lead you into all truth. If you've got a truth that you don't understand, that you doubt, that you question, that something in the Bible you don't understand, you pray to the Holy Spirit, and the Holy Spirit eventually will lead you to that truth. It won't take Him long either. Lastly, love them, lift them, limit them, lead them, and lastly, laugh with them. You shouldn't be such a a Puritan... That your kids see you as this staunch theologian that can never have any fun. Laugh with them. Kids are the funniest things God has put on this planet. When I was a kid, there, there are videos of this. I don't know why, but I didn't crawl at first. I scooted. I'd put my feet out in front of me, and then I'd draw them up close to me, and I would scoot across the floor. I've hid that video. My dad said, when you were a kid, I thought, look at that idiot. He's he's never going to, what's he doing? I mean, Chuck's over there building buildings out of of blocks, and I'm scooting across the floor on my fanny. I'm I'm glad I got one smart one, because he's going to take care of that one. When Camille was little, you think think your teenagers are not going to do this, but teenagers ask some of the dumbest questions. Camille said, uh, we were sitting in the living room. She said, what's the difference between a cow and a bull? And I said, well, Camille, the girl cow is a cow and the boy cow is a bull. And when they get married, (laughs) and she said, no, 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 I'm not talking about that. I'm not talking about how they're made. She said, I'm just asking when... When you give birth to something with horns like that, does it not hurt? (laughs) Just laugh. As a parent, sometimes we just need to lighten up and go with 
with where they're... I will tell you this as a parent. If you get in the car and they're talking to you, do not interrupt them. I don't care if they're 3 or 13. If they're talking, let them talk. Let them, let them run and tell you everything. Because there's coming a day they're going to feel like they can't tell you. So while they're talking, let them talk. Laugh with them. Laugh at yourself. One of the things we like to do as a family is, is watch Family Feud. I know sometimes it's not very clean, and, but we like watching Family Feud together. We think it's hilarious. We give our own answers. We spend a lot of time playing games together. Your home should be the place that they look forward to going to more than any other place. Even when they get to be teenagers, they ought to be the ones that say, Hey, let's go over to my house. Not that there's sin there, but they know if I go to mom and dad's house, they'll let us have a good time. They won't hold us back. They'll let us have fun. And I'm not talking about the wrong kind of fun. There was some game that came out years ago where you danced. And you got points for doing the right dance move. Now, the devil did ruin dancing. I mean, Miriam did dance and David did dance. So they were playing that game. I was watching them play that game. They got me up. There's a video of this too. They said, just one time, Daddy, please, one time. And I don't want to be the old Puritan guy sitting there in the black hat. Thou shalt not dance in thy father's head. <laughs> so I got up and I said, okay, I'll try it one time. That, that is one of the funniest videos we've got of me trying to... I was just trying to get the points. Me trying to get points on that game. The Bible says, a merry heart doeth good like a medicine. Make your home a place where your spouse, your children, whoever comes there, they're going to get joy and laughter. And it's a haven from the darkness of this world that's outside there. It's going to be out there when they go to the grocery store. The darkness is going to be out there. But let your home be a place where there's no pornography, a place where there's no wicked magazines, where there's no wicked movies. Let your place be a place where they can come in spiritually and know that when I go over to mom and dad's house, that's a, that's a haven where I know there's not going to be any wickedness. But this is just, just, just a place where I can feel God. Because they want God here. That means we don't have fun. No. Some of y'all are mad at me because I dance. Look at, look at this. I wasn't dancing. I was having fun with my kids. Lighten up. Laugh with them. All of these things bring you into a place where you're, you are honorable to them because these are all the things that God does. God loves you. God lifts you up. God sets limits. God is a God that when it comes to your relationship with Him, is a God that laughs right along with you. You don't think sometimes the things that you do, the funny things that you do, that God's not up there chuckling at you. Look at that. Look at the thug down there. Look at that. Well, well, I don't, there are sometimes on the golf course, I am sure that him and Teague are up there, and Teague is just whispering in his ear what to happen, and then it'll happen, and they'll just, you know, just chuckle. Look at what Zane did right there. Good night. What a terrible golf. I want to be honorable. I want my kids. I don't want to be honorable. I want my kids to say, my dad is honorable. He's not perfect. He's made mistakes. He's raised me to know that whatever he does, he's going to do for my best effort. My best interest. Because he has loved me. Because he has always lifted me up. He has limited me to protect me. And he does come along and... He allows me to laugh with him and enjoy his company just like my heavenly father does. Jesus said this. They said, Jesus, teach us to pray. And Jesus said, when you pray, say, our father. That is the best part of that prayer right there. That you can go to God and say, instead of saying, thou mighty, gracious God of all the universe. And he is. He said, no, don't say that. Say, Paul said that we can cry, Abba, Father. This Father's Day, let us be honorable men. Not like the world thinks we are, but let us be honorable men. 
It's not toxic masculinity. Masculinity is something that God put inside of us. And it's not to be afraid or to hurt people. It is, it is something that God gave us that we could be what we're supposed to be in our homes, in our marriages, in our churches, and in our communities. 